Good morning, my excellent friends. A little sleepy, maybe a little, a little tired from having to drive through the snow, but it is good to see your smiling faces here this morning. I hope that the first week of 2024 hasn't been too hard on you, has it? Well, no matter what the case may be, if, if, if this week has been a nightmare and you are just happy to be in the house of the Lord uh, on the Lord's Day, celebrating him at the beginning of the week, uh, which hopefully will not be like last week, uh, or if your week was all sunshine and rainbows, or whatever was in between, what I want to do with you today is I want for us to get ready for this coming year. It's only been a week. Okay, so here, right here, this morning, let's hit the reset button. Okay, we've been through one week of 2024. Maybe it went the way you hoped it would. Maybe it didn't. But no matter what the case may be, there is plenty of time to make 2024 the best year yet. Okay, now, who here is a football fan? Let's see your hands. Okay, I know that's a sore subject right now for Eagles fans, right? Okay, who here stopped being a football fan after the loss last week? <laughs> Okay, uh, but no, seriously, uh, how many of you know how football coaches uh, run their team in the opening moments of the game? How many of you know how that works? Okay, some of you do, okay. okay. Well, the way it works for those of you who don't know is what they do is they draw up a game plan, okay? And, and what I'm specifically talking about is they draw up a script of plays that they follow, okay? They draw up about 15 plays that they're going to run to start the game no matter what, okay? doesn't matter how the beginning of the game goes. If it goes horribly, they still run these 15 plays, okay? Now, that may sound like a silly idea, okay? But there is good reason why they do it, okay? The script that they draw up is designed to not only see how the other team responds to what they do so that they can see what might work for the rest of the game against them, but it's also designed to kind of feel out their own players. Okay, the, the, the coach... Uh, he might draw up some, some short, easy, high percentage passes for his quarterback to make to help him get his confidence up early in the game. Okay? He might draw up uh, different running plays with different blocking schemes to see how the defense reacts to those different blocking schemes. Okay? And once they've gone through those pre-scripted plays, what the coach does is he takes what he just learned from running those plays and adjusts his game plan for the rest of the game accordingly. At least that's what he's supposed to do. Okay, it doesn't always work that way. Okay, now, what he learns from those 15 plays may hold true for the rest of the game. But it might not. Okay, it all depends on how the other team adjusts to what they're doing. Okay, but it gives him a blueprint to follow. Okay, so here we are. One week has gone by. You've run your 15 pre-scripted plays for the year of 2024. How did it go? Hey, well, maybe everything went well. Hey, uh, maybe it didn't. But right now is the time to get everything right. Right now is the time to make adjustments before things get out of hand. So what I want for us to do here this morning is I want for us to refocus ourselves Last week, Pete talked to us about living in the realization that the new covenant is here. And this morning, what we're going to see is one of the first people to see that truth in the flesh and how he responds to it. Okay? But before we get there, I want to prime you for what's coming. I want to challenge us to really examine ourselves right now. The first week of the new year has come and gone and how have you responded to the fact that God's new covenant that he established through his son, Jesus Christ, is here? Did the script work? Did it? Well, keep that in mind as we dive into the text this morning. Because what I desire for every single one of us, for you, for me, for Cornerstone, for the church as a whole, is for 2024 to be the year that we can look back on and say, man, I rock that. Okay, I want 2024 to be the best year of all of our lives so far. 
Okay, so let's dive in. Let's take out your Bibles. Join me in the book of Luke chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 21. And as you are getting there, as you're flipping your pages, I, uh, I just want to say that I love Luke, and I love the way he writes. In fact, the information that Luke gives us in his two books is one of the main reasons that we can be absolutely, completely, utterly, positively sure that the Bible is a reliable source. Okay? But that is, that is a complete tangent that I could go on, but I don't want to go on it right now because if you get me started down that tangent, I might not stop. Okay, so I'm going to control myself and not go down. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it in Sunday school, okay? okay? But uh, uh, I'm going to control myself right now. So let's dive in, okay? The text this morning says, Okay, starting at verse 21, it says, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Okay, so we are now eight days removed from the events that happened that glorious night in a manger in Bethlehem. And the time has come for the baby boy to be circumcised and named in keeping with the covenant established with Abraham. Note that Mary and Joseph remain true to the direction given by God through the angel Gabriel, okay? It would have been super easy for Mary and Joseph, when they go to have the baby name, to go, you know what? What's in a name? A rose by any other name will smell as sweet, right? So who cares if we're supposed to name him Jesus? Let's just name him Joseph. That's your name. Or let's name him after a relative, okay? Because that would be the common practice, okay? In fact, the, 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 the fact that they name the baby what they do probably confirmed to a lot of people exactly what they were already thinking about Mary. Hey, you're supposed to name it after the father or a relative. So they must have named him that because that's what the real father's name is. Okay, but despite that, despite the, the stigma that's going to come from it, Mary and Joseph are both devout and obedient servants of God. So they give him the name that the angel directed them to give him. Now, we call him Jesus. That's the Greek form of the Hebrew name Yeshua or Joshua. Okay? And the name means Yahweh saves. And they're to name him that because it's an indication of the entire purpose that this child's life will have. His life will tell the entire world that very message, that Yahweh saves. Okay? And then some time passes. And it says, when the time for, the, for their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of, of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to Yahweh and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of Yahweh, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So according to the law, after a woman gives birth, she has to wait 40 days to be purified from the bleeding that occurs during childbirth. Okay, blood can carry disease, and so the woman needs to wait until she's purified from that bleeding before she can go to the temple. Okay, now, Mary and Joseph, careful to obey that law, okay, because they're devout, obedient servants of God. Okay, and then, when, once that time's up, they take the baby Jesus to the temple to consecrate him to the Lord as the firstborn male son, just like the law says. Okay, now, does this mean that Jesus is supposed to stay in the temple and function as like a little mini priest, like we saw Samuel do at the, the book of Samuel? Hey, well, during the time when Jesus is born, it is believed by the Israelite people that the Levites actually basically function as a stand-in for all of those firstborn males. Okay, so parents aren't required to give their kid over to the temple and the kid has to serve in the temple uh, under the Levites. The Levites are performing that function for the Israelites instead, okay? Now, there are a few interesting things that we can note here, okay? First, the fact that Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem would indicate that they, mo might, they most likely have not left Bethlehem yet. Okay, Bethlehem is only six miles south of Jerusalem, so it's an easy trek to go from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. If they went back to Nazareth, that's a lot more of a journey. Okay, so they're probably still in Bethlehem. Okay? And what we can also figure out from this passage is that Joseph is not a wealthy man. Because what the law actually requires, if you go back to the text that it's referring to, is that a sacrifice of a lamb and a pigeon or a dove is necessary. Okay? But it says if the parents can't afford a lamb, 
well, then two pigeons or two doves works. Okay, that's supposed to be an acceptable sacrifice. Mary and Joseph have to make the cheaper option. They have to take the cheaper option, the cheaper choice of the sacrifices. They are not wealthy by any means. They can't even afford the lamb. Okay, it says, now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Holy Spirit, he went into the temple courts. So we get introduced to Simeon, a man of God, righteous and devout, who has been waiting patiently and eagerly for the coming of Yahweh's Messiah. And he has been, been informed by God that he will not die until he has seen that promised hope with his very own eyes. And it just so happened that he went into the temple courts the very same day that Mary and Joseph were bringing the baby to offer the sacrifices as a newborn son. What a coincidence. No, it's a, it says that the Spirit led him to go to the temple that day. Okay? Now, this is really interesting, okay? and we may not catch it because we just kind of tend to think that the Holy Spirit always functions like it does now, okay? But the truth of the matter is, back then, before the day of Pentecost, after Jesus ascended to the Father and God's Spirit, Holy Spirit was poured on his people, it functioned differently. It didn't abide with us like it does now. Instead, it only visited certain individuals at certain times for specific purposes. And Simeon is one of those certain individuals that the Holy Spirit decides to visit. And the message it delivered to him was that he will not die till he sees God's plan for salvation. And it even directs him so that he's able to have that come to fruition. Now it gets even more interesting in a second, but this is way cool. This means that Simeon, the guy we were just introduced to, is a very special individual. He's one of the few people that the Holy Spirit of God decided to visit back before it started to abide with us. It's also very cool to note that we can see God working just as he directs us to work in spreading the good news of salvation. Okay, where does God start? He starts first with Jewish shepherds on the night of Jesus' birth, and here, the next one to see the promised Messiah is a good, devout Jewish man who's been waiting for it forever in the temple courts. Okay? He starts in Jerusalem in the temple, and then as the story progresses the word of Jesus, about the word of Jesus and who he is, it spreads out to Judea and Samaria, and as we stand here, it has reached the ends of the earth. But it starts at home. Okay, we lose sight of that. Okay, we want to start out at the ends of the earth and then work our way back. That's not how it's supposed to work. It starts at home. It starts in your home, with your family, your loved ones. Okay, now, you look at me. And you say, it's harder to talk to them about Jesus than it is with a perfect stranger. My close relationship with them makes it a touchy subject. Okay? They know me too well. They know my hypocrisy. They know all the times that I've failed to live up to the standard that I should, the standard that I'm actually pulling them to as well. And what I say to that is, exactly. If they know you so intimately that they know all your shortcomings, it is the perfect opportunity to show them that accepting Jesus does not mean automatic perfection. Amen, right? We all go through a process to become more like Christ. It is not just some switch that you flip and all of a sudden you're Jesus. Okay, it is a struggle that we all go through. You don't have to get right first. Committing your life to Jesus means committing yourself to follow him, okay, to letting him be your boss and direct your path and your actions on that path. 
But the truth of the matter is, no one does it perfect. But there should be some type of change that they've seen in you that is evidence of your sanctification process working and God working through you in that, okay? If they don't see that change, well, then it's time to adjust your game plan. Okay? But if you can have calm conversations with family members who may not be willing to acknowledge Jesus for who he is and who know you intimately and have all kinds of ammo that they can throw at you to try and defeat your point and throw you off your game, well, then talking to strangers ought to be a piece of cake because they don't even know you. Okay, So start at home and work your way out. There is a reason God tells us to do the things that he tells us to do it the way he tells us to do it. So follow it, and you'll find out that he's right. It says, when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, okay, dot, 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 and we'll get to what he says in a second here, okay? Now, this is weird. Okay, parents of young children in the room, if some strange old man walks up to you, even at church, and tries to grab your child, what would your response be? Exactly, yeah. That, 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 that strange old man probably is not going to be much longer for this world, right? Okay? But that is not the response by Mary and Joseph here. No, they hand their precious little child over. They hand over the baby that was given to them by God foretold by heavenly messengers, celebrated by choirs of angels, miraculously worshipped by strangers on the night that he was born. They hand that kid over to this weird old man. Now, what is going on here? Well, I think what's going on here is something that I was actually talking with Pete about this past week. Okay, Pete, Pete was remarking about how he just recently found out that one of the guys that he met while he does his, the crazy races that he does, uh, that that guy that he met turns out to be a Christian. And when he was talking about it, Pete said, how in the world does it work out like that? That out of the hundreds, if not thousands of people I could have come in contact with and developed a friendship with, this guy also ends up to be a Christian as well. Hey, how does that work? Okay. Well, my response to uh, Pete, I think, is the exact response that I would have for what's going on in the text today. Okay, Deep calls out to deep. Okay. See, Mary and Joseph are two people who have been visited by a being that stands in the very presence of God all the time. Just sits there waiting for God to give him a direction and a message to go out and give to somebody. Okay. The hand of God is all over that being. Okay, And they can see that same thing on Simeon when he comes to take their child out of their arms. They can see the hand of God on this weird old man. And rather than acting like any normal parent would and try and protect their child from the stranger, they willingly hand him over. And when they do, Simeon begins to praise God. He says, Sovereign Yahweh, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to all your people, Israel. And then he died. I'm totally kidding. He did not die. Okay, I'm just making sure you're paying attention. Okay, but real quick, let's look at what Sivia just said. Okay, this is where it gets very interesting. Okay, and it gets interesting because I think Right here, you can see the work of the Holy Spirit on Simeon more than anywhere else. Okay? First off, he points to the fact that Jesus will be the one that brings salvation. That Jesus is Yahweh's salvation. He says that Jesus is the means by which we can be saved. This is God's prescription for salvation, and it is only found in this child that he holds. He also states, it's not a secret. God has done this in the sight of everybody so that all who seek Yahweh's salvation can find it. 
And now this is where it gets really interesting, because he says that this child, this Savior, is a light to the Gentiles. Wait a minute. What did just about every good Jew who was waiting for the coming Messiah believe that the coming Messiah was going to be? He's going to be a military leader. The Messiah's job, according to all the good Jews, was to come in and kick out all the Gentiles. How can he be a light of revelation for them? Maybe the revelation that they shouldn't have messed with Israel. No, see, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Simeon. Through God's hand on him, he's able to recognize that the salvation that God is providing through this child is not ethnocentric to the Jewish nation. It is for all people everywhere, Jew and Gentile alike. That is really cool to see him recognizing it. And then he finally states that Jesus will be a glory for Israel as well. Because out of this seed of Abraham that he's holding in his arms, through which God promised the patriarch, all the world will be blessed, the entire world is able to achieve reconciliation with God. The books are brought back into alignment. And man and God are able to come to agreement with each other. The promise made so very long ago is fulfilled. It says the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Can you imagine what Mary and Joseph are thinking right now? Both of them first-time parents have been told that they need to be the parents of the Savior of the world. I mean, sure, things went kind of crazy the night the kid was born, but it's been 40 days since then. It's been, it's been rather quiet for these 40 days. But now, here is this old dude in the temple screaming at the top of his lungs that their child is the Messiah. They have got to be wondering if, like, this is what life is going to be like, like, from now on. Hey, is this how it's always going to work when we take this kid somewhere? I can't imagine what they're thinking here. They're marveling at it. Okay, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So Simeon, moved by the Holy Spirit, issues a warning to these Marveling parents. These parents are going, oh my gosh, is this what it's going to be like always? And Simeon decides to, through God, give them a warning like, hey, more stuff's on the way. Okay? A warning that was proven true as we see the story of this child's life lived out. Okay? In Jesus' own words, I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. So Simeon received the fulfillment of the long-awaited promise that he'd received from God. He saw with his very own eyes the Savior of the world. Can you, can you imagine how his heart must have been fluttering as he was reaching out to take that child from them? How his pulse must have quickened when he took that baby in his arms and held God's salvation in the flesh. He had waited, we don't know how long. Okay, tradition holds that Simeon was an old, old man, maybe even in his 90s. And he had waited for his entire life to see the promise of God. But here's my question for you today. As we sit here with the seal on a brand spanking new year, just broken, what are you waiting for? Simeon was waiting for God's promised Messiah. But right here, right now, he's already come. Salvation is here. So I ask you again, what are you waiting for? Today is the day. Ever since the beginning of time, everything had been pointing to Jesus 
coming. Creation had been waiting in anticipation for the revealing of God's plan for salvation. Everyone should have known that the old system, the old covenant, did not work. Pete pointed that out to us last week. Jesus coming was inevitable. And then at just the right moment, he came. And shepherds and angels and even old men couldn't help but acknowledge what had just occurred. And today, there's still no denying it. Jesus was an actual historical person. But more so than that, he was God in the flesh. Like the myths, those ancient myths of God coming down and meddling in human existence, but still completely unlike that, because with Jesus, it actually happened. Okay? Dionysus, Horus, Mithra, all those ancient gods never actually existed. But Jesus is an actual historical man. And he actually did what the Bible claims that he did. Okay? There is an empty tomb. Okay? Come on now. He is not dead. He is alive. And what that means is he is who he claimed to be. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He came to do exactly what Simeon said he would. He came to save his people, not just Israel, but Gentiles like you and me, to bring us back into proper relationship with God. And he wants to be in a relationship with you. So what are you waiting for? Salvation is here. That means it's time to change the game plan for your life. Don't let another year, another, another minute, another second go by before you accept this gift that he is freely giving you. You can be free from sin and death. You can live with the Father forever in heaven if you will but accept him. Salvation can be found, and it is found in Jesus Christ alone. Let this first Sunday in the year 2020, 2024 be the moment that you come home. Now is the time. And I'll explain how to make that happen in just one second, okay, if that's you. Okay? But what about everybody else here? Because I need to talk to you guys now. Okay? What about those of us that have already made that commitment? Okay? What will our response be? Well, the fact of the matter is, Jesus is still a sign that is spoken against, just like Simeon said he would be. If you stand up for Jesus, other people are going to try and sit you right back down. It might be uncomfortable. You might lose friends, maybe even family. It will not be all butterflies and something. But if we are identified in Christ, in Jesus, he commands us to take up our cross and follow him. Okay? Now, what does he mean by that? What is Jesus referencing when he tells us to take up our cross? Okay? Well, he is referencing Roman crucifixion. Okay? In a crucifixion, the one condemned to die was required to carry their own cross to the site of execution. That is the image that Jesus is calling forth in reference to what it means to follow him. It means we must be willing to lay down everything, even our lives, in service of him. So my excellent friends, what will your response be? How will you adjust to what God has revealed to us? On this first Sunday in the year 2024, let us resolve ourselves to follow God wherever he may lead, even if it leads us up the hill of execution. Maybe in the past you've wavered. Okay? Things got a little too uncomfortable, and you shrunk back. You failed to follow him when it got tough. Maybe you became run down and tired. 
Like life got in the way, and not only did you stop standing up for Jesus, but you stopped putting in the work, the hard work, that's necessary to grow and flourish in Christ. Okay, statistics show that only about 12% of churchgoers read their Bible on a daily basis. Let me ask you this. How can you be plugged into the game plan? How can you know what play to run if you aren't listening to the coach? Okay, and we wonder why the, the world is going the way it is. See, if, if the players on the football team decide that they don't want to listen to the coach and run the plays that he's calling, they just, uh, instead decide to just do their own thing, the result will be unordered chaos. Philadelphia Eagles fans, you know this because one of the players just admitted that they did that in one of the games, and it messed the whole thing up. They lost the game because of it. Okay? That's what we've got amongst Christians today. Everyone's just doing their own thing, not listening to the coach, and it is unordered chaos. It's time to get it right. It's time to start listening to the coach, okay? And it starts with us. It starts with you and me. So how will we respond today? Brothers and sisters, let 2024 be the year that we shine. Let this year be the year that we declare that we belong to Jesus without hesitation or fear. Let it be the year that we look back on and can truthfully say with no equivocation, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now, we're going to do something a little different here. Okay, musicians, you can start coming forward. Okay, we are going to do a song that I'm not sure that we have ever done on Sunday morning. I don't think we have. Pete says no. Okay, we've never done it on Sunday morning. Okay, but when we do it on Wednesday, it is a running song. <laughs> okay? But I'm going to make a special request here this morning. Okay, because I challenged you with two things this morning. Okay? And it's one thing to resolve in your own mind that you're going to accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord or that you are going to uh, recommit yourself to following him wholeheartedly. And it is an entirely different thing to proclaim that before others. So what I want to do is I want to encourage you. If you made either commitment here this morning, if you're committing yourself to Jesus for the first time, you are recommitting yourself to following him again. I want to challenge you to come forward. Okay, elders, I'm going to ask you to stand at the ends of either, either, either aisle here. Okay, and they're going to be sitting here waiting for you to come and pray with you. So if there are any kids in the room, okay, I want to make one request here, okay? I want to request that once, just this once, that we not run on this song. But rather, the only running that I do want to see is those that have committed themselves to the Lord this morning. Whether that be for the first time or in a spirit of renewal. Running to the front to declare that they belong to Jesus. And as we leave this place, let us leave with the Holy Spirit guiding us to shine just as Jesus did into a lost world and broken world. Okay? When the music starts, it's not a terribly long song. So when the music starts, come running. Don't hesitate. Let's sing.